Welcome back to Walk with TFB. Tim Bryson here, and as y'all know, I'm a Black millennial who is eager to have and build a conversation with authentic people centered on education, sport, and culture. Today, we are walking with an influencer, an entrepreneur, and a speech language pathologist. A Charlotte native, our guest earned her bachelor's degree in public health from the University of South Carolina. While at Carolina, she played in the marching band, was an active member in Tau Beta Sigma Honorary Band Sorority, and an annual participant in Relay for Life. Originally convinced she was going to pursue pharmacy as a career, an experience at Linda Mood Bell Instruction changed her life and propelled her to earn her master's degree in speech language pathology, a second degree from the real USC. While a grad student, she was a research assistant in the written language lab, member of the National Black Association for Speech, Language, and Hearing, and was one of 11 students nationwide to receive the 2018 Student Preparing for Academic Research Careers Award from the American Speech Language Hearing Association. The following year, she became the first student in her department's history to earn the Jeffrey Keith Madison Outstanding Student Achievement Award. Her recognition is a reflection of her leadership in this industry. Alongside serving as a full-time speech language pathologist, she started her own business entitled The Listening SLP LLC. As a private practice owner, she specializes in hearing loss, reading disorders, adult oral rehabilitation, and language disorders. She also facilitates the, the Listening SLP platforms on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, providing free and accessible information to all. Her purpose is to help all children find their voice and assist families throughout the process. She loves to help mentor and assist grad students as they go throughout their process of becoming a speech language pathologist. And though I'm very surprised we got her on the show, it's time to walk. So without further ado, y'all help me welcome Sydney. I'm sorry. What's up, Sydney? Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. That was a great introduction. <laughs> Don't play with me, yo. Don't play with the pod. I'm trying to tell you. I listen, I am so excited to be here today and talk with you. I'm so trying to tell you, Sydney, I'm excited too. Um, like I said, I've told people at the, at the beginning of this season that we're going to have educators and talk about education in all spaces. Um, and to be honest, I got I got kind of comfortable. I stayed within my bubble and what I knew. But this is a topic and this is an industry that I'm not as familiar with. And I'm bringing on not just one of the rising stars, but I'm going to go out on a limb uh, and confidently say one of the experts um, in this field who continue to shape what it looks like in the future. So I'm hyped. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm hyped. So check this out, Cindy. You know how the podcast works. But before we jump into segment one, what is bringing you Black joy, especially in this new year? Oh, my goodness. Um, so you read off in my bio like that I'm a private practice owner. That's new. I like haven't even announced it to my followers on uh, Instagram. So by the time this episode comes out, my announcement will be out there. But that is bringing me some serious joy um, because who out here um, is getting to like own their own business at the age of 26 and doing their own thing and being whatever they want it to be. Um, so that is bringing me tons of joy and just, you know, relaxing, having more time to be present in my own life is about to be amazing. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to dive uh, deeper into um, you becoming a private practice owner, but congratulations yeah. again. Thank you. Um, but we're not going to go no further in this conversation without uh, transitioning to segment one and asking you, what is your story? What's your story, Sydney? That is a really good one. So, um, you know, you mentioned I, I grew up here in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is where I'm living now. And in my entire like life, I never heard of a speech language pathologist. Um, you know, I grew up in a predominantly white area. It was really up and coming in Charlotte at the time. And so it was gr a lot of great experiences, but also sometimes it was pretty lonely because for the majority of the time, like especially in elementary school, I was the only black girl in my entire grade. Um, and then as things transitioned in the middle and high school, you know, it was a little bit more diverse, but not really. And so I knew going into um, like undergrad that I had to do something that was going to help me be successful and make money. Like th those were the two things my parents told me, you need to look in the newspaper. And if you can find a job in the newspaper or online, then you can go get a degree in that. But if not, then you don't need to be majoring in that. So I decided I was going to be a pharmacist. I was like, oh, you know what? This is cool. Pharmacists make good money. I'll have that title of doctor. 
Like I am all for it. Um, and then I took organic chemistry too. And that was like a slap in the face of like, girl, that is totally not for you. <laughs> that is not your thing. Uh, so I was kind of floundering. Like I didn't know what I wanted to do. I think at one point I called home and said, I'm going to be an accountant like my mom. And she goes, no, you're not like numbers aren't your thing either. So that's not for you. Um, so I was a little bit lost if I'm being honest. And then my brother uh, got diagnosed with dyslexia and ADHD. And he ended up going to a reading center and got help uh, to kind of learn how to read. I mean, he had never really had like really strong reading instruction, plus he was dyslexic. And so after that, I interviewed with that place. I was like, you know, that's kind of cool. And you get to help people in a different way. Um, so I ended up working there and I loved it. I worked there for two summers in undergrad. And by the second summer, I was like, you know what? Like, I don't want to work at this company full time, uh, but I do want to like figure out what else I can do with this experience. And so a master's in speech pathology was kind of where I landed at. It was going to get me out of undergrad the quickest uh, with getting my bachelor's in public health. So I didn't have to go be a teacher and start all over again but it was gonna allow me to put myself in a different market uh, to really kind of do what I wanted to do. And then that's how I kind of ended up here. This is good. This is really, really good. I'm, I appreciate you laying the foundation for what's gonna, uh, what we're gonna discuss next. And the first of which is why South Carolina, especially being a you know, North Carolina you know, resident? Yeah, uh, so why, why South Carolina? I don't know. Um, originally, I actually wanted to go to Hampton. And I had gotten into the honors college. I went to honors weekend and I was ready to go. Um, and then my parents forced me to apply to South Carolina. I actually didn't want to apply at all. And they're like, you know, it's a little bit closer than Hampton was. They're like, why don't you just check it out and see what it's like? Um, so I went, I applied, I actually got in. And then I did a tour after I was admitted to the school. Uh, and on that tour, I fell in love. I mean, I fell in love with the campus. I fell in love with the culture that USD had. Um, and at the time wanting to go to pharmacy school, I loved their college of pharmacy. I mean, they were like cutting edge. They had some great stuff going on. Um, so I was like, this is where I want to be. And so the farm, okay, the farm at program in South Carolina is fire. I, mean, it's, I know it's nationally ranked on and everything else, but you were a farm D with a hopeful, right? Uh, pursuant for a minute, obviously took OCHEM, that changed everything. But while in school, you were still involved in a marching band. You were still involved in a sorority. So talk to us more about the experiences in undergrad that, that helped to shape not just your career and your leadership now, but you know who you are as well. Yeah, so I had done band for four years um, in high school. I marched all four years. Um, and then South Carolina, I'm like terrible. I didn't want to do anything, uh, but my, my family forced me to do that too. They were like, you know what? Why don't you check out their marching band? Um, They're like, you want to go to all the football games anyway? You should just do the band. You'll have a guaranteed ticket. Plus, um, at the time, South Carolina's marching band is considered under athletics. And so they actually offered in-state tuition to out-of-state residents if you did band. So it was kind of like you get to do something fun that you like and like this is going to help you financially in the long run. Uh, so I ended up doing it. I was only going to do it for a couple of years, um, but I ended up doing it all four years and have absolutely no regrets at all. It was probably one of the best decisions ever. I got to travel while doing it. Uh, I got to go to all the bowl games uh, and be there for all the big moments um, in South Carolina football history at the time. And then while I did that, there was a band sorority. Um, so I did Tau Beta Sigma. And it was also a great experience. I mean, I got to serve the band community that I was already a part of. So, Sydney, you mentioned South Carolina, right? Pharmacy as a, as a career interest, being part of the band. Those are all decisions you are either forced and are strongly, strongly, strongly encouraged to consider. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Isn't that terrible? I was like it, an awful 18 year old. I mean, I, mean, I wanted to make no decisions. I mean, that, that's I get that. And that's fine. But even reflecting back now, like what is one decision or a couple of decisions that you choose chose to make on your own that has helped to shape where you are today and who you are today? Uh, so the biggest one was deciding that I no longer was going to be a pharmacy major. Um, and I actually got a little bit of pushback 
uh, my grandfather is older and he was like, you know, you're switching into a public health degree. What is that going to do for you? What is your money going to look like? Everybody knows what a pharmacist is, but nobody really knows one, what you can do with a bachelor's in public health. And two, when I said, oh, I'm going to be a speech pathologist, they're like, well, what is that? Um, and what are you doing? And why are you making these decisions when we know if you go on to be a pharmacist, you can be successful and make good money doing that? All right, so I'm going to sit on this for a second. I think I've had this experience with my mom coming out of grad school saying I'm going to make $11 an hour with a master's degree. Um, my brother had this experience recently quitting his job to do something totally different than what he studied and earned his master's in too. But there are plenty of people, plenty of people across the world who either choose to do something because of the money, right? And they get into it and like, I have, I have no purpose, right? I have no, I have no joy in this work, but I'm making a lot of money. On the other end of the spectrum, there, there are a lot of people in these like service, helping healthcare fields who are doing meaningful work, <laughs> purposeful direct service providing work, but not getting paid, right? And so particularly within the Black community, and I'm not the spokesperson, but it's our experience that I'm going to speak to. I feel as if there's pressure. I want you to push back or, or speak or say, you know, speak differently, but pressure to do things to, to make money, either to get out of where we came from, to either maintain what we grew up in, which can deter us away from pursuing things we're passionate about, things in line with our purpose, you know, things in line with our vision, et cetera. And so when I share that with you now, like, I guess, what have you seen in your own experience, particularly switch, making that switch from farm to speech pathology and how you've been able to communicate and connect with other grad students who maybe experienced something different or something similar, excuse me. Yeah, no, I, I would 100% agree with you. Um, and I think, unfortunately, within helping professions, whether it's speech, whether it's occupational, whether it's uh, physical therapy, or even when you're looking at the doctor level, um, there's not a lot of support out there for Black students. And so, like, unfortunately, like, that is something that a lot of us have to think about. You know, I was very fortunate from the background that I came from. I had support throughout my master's program. And so I had a little bit more flexibility financially to make some of those decisions where I'm like, you know, I don't have to think about the money for right now. This is what I want to do. Um, but it's true. And like I said, like, you know, my my parents were older when they had me. Uh, so even their mindset was older at times. Mm -hmm. Like you have to do things um, for the money per se, but not necessarily for the thing that you love. And eventually, you know, with talking with family, uh, it kind of came around full circle. And now they're like, girl, you're doing the thing. But it took it took time to get there. It took time to get there. And so before, before I transition as a segment too, I do want us and want you to talk more about your graduate experience, uh, because I mentioned the National Black Association for Speech, Language, and Hearing. Uh, you're involved, you're co-social chair for another association as well, but talk, can you talk more about what you're involved in, what you chose to be engaged with um, as a grad student? Yeah, so I um, was a lot more intentional about things that I did in grad school <laughs> than I was in undergrad. Uh, so the first thing that I did was I was a graduate research um, assistant. Uh, and the professor who I ended up working with, she, I met her in undergrad. I met her on a fluke. She came to a class and she was looking for volunteers. And so I was like, oh yeah, I'll volunteer. Like, I want to go to grad school anyway. This is a good experience. And like, what she was researching um, at the time was something I was really interested in, which was looking at literacy outcomes. So I agreed, she brought me on, and then it ended up turning into like a really beautiful mentorship relationship that's still going on today. Like I call her um, for all my big wins and I call her whenever I have questions. Um, and she's actually no longer even at the University of South Carolina. So we have maintained a good relationship. Uh, so that was the first thing I did that was intentional was I uh, did a lot of research because it takes a different mind to be analytical about the data that you're taking in. And within any field of study, um, people are going to put out research, but you need to be a good consumer of research. And in order to be a good consumer, in my personal opinion, you, you need to know what it feels like to go through all the steps from mm -hmm. like when an idea starts all the way out to dissemination of writing a paper. And so I did that um, in grad school. The second thing I did was I got involved in some of the 
um, associations that they had. So in Basla, which is the National Black uh, Speech Language Hearing Association is one that I got involved with. And I actually went to the conference that they had my last semester of grad school and got to meet a lot of professionals. So that, that was a good connection because being at South Carolina, I was the only um, person of color in my entire uh, <laughs> class for my master's program. There was nobody else that looked like me. Um, there was one faculty member and none of my external practicum supervisors ever looked like me. So being able to like forge that connection with other black professionals was something invaluable because our field, um, which we're gonna talk a little bit about later, but like Tim, you probably don't know this, speech pathology is like ranked in the top 10 of whitest professions in this country. It's 92% white, 8% black and black people make 3% of the 8%. Yeah, so being able to connect with other people that looked like me was huge. Um, and then like to do some other things is I did the Spark Award and so, that was uh, students preparing for academic research careers. They only select like 11 people nationally and I put in, and one thing that I was intentional about with that is like, yeah, I had the research, like I was gonna do a research project. Um, you know, yes, I was going to do a teaching, like help a professor with teaching a class and, you know, do a course, whatever, that stuff's cool. But I think the part about academia that a lot of people kind of miss out on is that community aspect, that community outreach. Um, for me, especially like as an SLP, there's a lot of stigma in the black community about disability in general. And then when that word IEP, individualized education plan gets brought up, it's like, you're about to slap a label on my kid. And so you get parents that shut the door immediately. Um, so one thing that we did while I was working in the written language lab is we did a lot of community outreach. I made sure that like we talked about ways that we could give back to our community. And it wasn't even just at the level of working with kids, but we also even went down to um, Claflin for a day and we did like three classes uh, in which we talked about like, what is a speech pathologist? Why is this field important? And why do we need to see more black representation um, in our field? And so the experiences that I had in grad school uh, for me have been unmatched. And I mean, they've really shaped who I am as a professional today. Yes, in the segment two, and we, we got to lay this foundation, at least this foundational definition we're going to use uh, on this podcast. And ask the question, what is a speech language pathology? Like yeah, at, just at its like, core, like what is like what is it? <laughs> I think that's like the million dollar question, right? Like, what is this thing that we are talking about? Sure. Uh, so commun so speech language pathologists are communication experts, essentially. Um, we work with language, we work with speech sound disorders, with people that have had strokes, um, people that have memory issues. And then there's this whole other beast, which I don't do, um, but it's also people that work with swallowing and work with the physiology of swallowing. So sometimes when people have had traumatic brain injuries or stroke, um, or sometimes even heart attacks, they might have difficulty with swallowing liquids and swallowing food. And so there is a tire uh, subset of SLPs that like that is what they do. They are swallowologists and they rock that. Okay, and so <laughs> this is good. The stereotypical, I guess, um, reason why the kids, children, adults, whomever, go to see an SLP is stuttering. But that's not the even beginning to scratch the surface of what all you can address, mm -hmm. what all you can work on, and help to improve uh, with your clients and with your, with your kids. And so what are some other, and I hate saying disorders, kind of language is important, but other disorders, conditions, uh, reasons as, as to why someone would go to see an SLP? Yeah, so I think you hit the nail on the head. A lot of SLPs tend to work in schools. Mm -hmm. um, so they see a lot of kids with articulation disorders, or that's just a fancy way of saying the way that they produce certain sounds. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of people don't know is that SLPs can work with birth all the way up to end of life. Um, so birth might look like, you know, kids that are having difficulty with imitating um, sounds, imitating like just gestures, things of that nature, pediatric feeding, 
Um, kids that have difficulty with like sensory different textures with foods might see an SLP literacy. Um, you might see an SLP to kind of work on how do you read and learning that process. Um, adults oriented, it might look like aphasia. So that is, you know, working on production of language or understanding of language, pro-stroke, uh, dementia and memory, um, adolescence, language comprehension, uh, reading comprehension, fluency, so stuttering, as you kind of mentioned before. Um, our field is wide open. I mean, and that's just like, I just scratched like the, the top off, but there are so many areas that SLPs can really work within. It's the master's only or master's required, no doc. Yeah, right now it's just master's. Um, they do have a clinical doctorate, but it's optional at this time. So you can just get a master's and do all of this. Okay, so two part question from your own perspective and obviously lived experiences. One, why don't more non-white students, particularly college students know about this industry? But then two, why should there be, and why does there need to be more black professionals working as SLPs, at least in the, in the US? Yeah, so I think to answer your first question, um, I think that there traditionally has been a lot of gatekeeping mm. in speech pathology. I mean, even to get into some of these master's programs, we all know the GRE is super problematic. Mm -hmm. So requiring the GRE, requiring these competitive GPAs, um, looking at letters of rec, it can be pretty standard. But the problem is if you have a student that's coming from a program in which like there's grade inflation, which we all know happens, and yes. someone that's not, um, they're not necessarily comparable. And then I think the other thing to notice is like all letters of rec, um, all things that we can't necessarily measure by a number. So like my undergrad GPA was not the most stellar thing in the world. But if someone looked at me based on that, um, and they did, I got waitlisted. I did not get into grad school um, first round, which I think shocks a lot of people, even some of the people within my department. And you look at where I am today, if I had taken like that, I got waitlisted attitude and went on to do something else, I wouldn't be in this field. And I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. Um, so those are those are things that I think contribute to it. Also, when we look at like who we see represented as SLPs, you don't see people that look like us there. Um, even in the advertisement, even when we see like for grad schools on their website, who who are SLPs in their program and the kids they serve, you generally might see like a white SLP working with white kids or white adults or a white SLP working with black and brown children. But you never really ever see the black SLP <laughs> working with the black kids or with the white kids, you know? Um, so I think subconsciously image is everything. And when you look at marketing, if I don't see myself in any of your marketing materials, why would I ever consider that this is something for me? Sure. And so one thing you said to me earlier was that you've been asked to speak on a lot of podcasts, a lot of do a lot of um, speaking engagements, et cetera, about, I'm sure, a plethora of different things. You really, what, just graduated two, three years ago, four years ago? Why, why do you believe that is? Why is everybody hitting you up? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think there are a couple of reasons. So one, I think, is my social media platform. Mm -hmm. And I think people like what I put out on the listening SLP. Um too, I think when we are looking at optics, like there are not a lot of black SLPs talking about content areas. Um, I think unfortunately, a lot, um, a lot of black SLPs unfortunately get pigeonholed into talking about diversity, mm -hmm. um, talking about, you know, their black experience as an SLP. A lot of people sometimes aren't valuing the fact that we're just as well um, content area specialists just as anybody else. And like one professional that comes to mind is Dr. Ianessa Humbert, um, who is a self-proclaimed swallowologist, and she does uh, swallowing physiology and anatomy and all that kind of stuff that I don't do, uh, but I would consider her an expert in that area, and yet she still talks about diversity too, but she's definitely an expert, and people are going to her for her expertise. We can talk about stuff besides diversity. 
So let's get into more of your day to day then. Right. And particularly talk more about um, your work philosophy, your leadership philosophy, counseling philosophy, and we're working with your clients. Uh, So how would you describe it? Yeah. So I use three words. I listen, I learn and I advocate. Um, I am really big on the fact that like this is I have the degree and I can make clinical decisions, but I can make clinical decisions. And if you're not going to follow them through, it means nothing. So the first thing is that we always need to listen, listen to the concerns of the families and the individuals that we're working with. Because if you can address what their concerns are, they are more likely to follow through with whatever you have just advised them to do as a professional. Um, I'm learning all the time from the people that I work with, from the families I serve and the individuals, because grad school teaches you textbook things, right? It doesn't teach us lived experience. We can (laughs) never know what someone else's lived experience is. Uh, And that is something invaluable that we always should value before anything else. And then advocate, like work alongside people to help them learn how to best advocate for themselves. Uh, We are not always as professionals gonna be right there with them, uh, but if we can give them the tools to be able to effectively communicate for what they need or for what their child needs, then they were setting them up for big success. That's real, that's super real. And earlier you had mentioned the um, stigma around IEPs, right? Particularly um, in in the education system. Um, as I mentioned to you before, there are a lot of people listening to this podcast and choose to, you know, opt in, you know, week in and week out, particularly work in higher ed, right? Most of which in college sport. There also is a stigma in a similar way, right? In regards to uh, disability, in regards to disability services office, uh, what you know, whatever you call it on your own campus in sport, right? In this other type of ability. So can you talk more about particularly the, the advocacy piece in regards to how I, but also how can those listening better support, but also advocate for uh, testing, right, for uh, treatment, for connecting with uh, individuals like yourself in the SLP industry to get these athletes, these students the help that they they really need? So I think the first thing is like, there are plenty of examples of athletes with um, disabilities, whether it's stuttering, whether it's dyslexia, whether it's, you know, language comprehension. I mean, they, we are out there, they are out there, they are out there, they are out there and they're successful still. Mm -hmm. So I think the first thing is to see like, it's okay to receive help. And these people are still successful, even though, you know, they are having similar challenges as you. So making it real for people, I think is the one thing. Um, But then talking about all the benefits of like what this means, You know, I think we focus a lot on the disability and the stigma that can come from it. But look, like when you have the services that you need, when you're getting all the supports that you need, like one, life can be a little bit easier for you because you're getting those proper supports and along the way. And then two, it helps you to be a better advocate for yourself. Um, I always think about, you know, my brother who I mentioned before has dyslexia. I always tell him like, listen, there is no shame in your dyslexia, but by you using all your resources, you're preventing things for yourself that could happen. We know that a lot of people with disabilities get taken advantage of. It's just facts that are out there. Um, Mm -hmm. So when we have students that are college age that can own that, like this is what I'm dealing with, it helps them along the way to kind of prevent some of that because you're having other people in your corner that can look over things for you, that can manage things for you um, to kind of take some of that, like people just taking advantage of you because they know you don't know out of the equation. Sure. But so then my, my question then becomes like, how do you balance between really transition between this, you know, receiving the help that you need, right. Beginning to advocate for yourself, but then taking the strategies, the tools, the lessons you've learned with this support into your next phase, right? Because you're not always going to have an SLP with you 24-7. You're not always going to have, you know, the learning support team with you 24-7. And then I think too often or not too often than not, it becomes reliance on this person or on this service and the learning application is not happening. And so how, how, do, we, how do we transition away, or away from reliance and more towards advocacy, self-ownership, self-authorship in the, in the way in which we choose to take care of ourselves? Yeah, so I think that when you are working with a professional, you need someone that's working on functional outcomes. And so whenever you are, um, whatever stage of like intervention or services you're at, you're working with someone who understands the functionality for you. So I don't work on things that my kids 
um, that I work with cannot use in real life and that mm. their parents can't use in real life because you're a hundred percent right. We're not always going to have a professional with us. You're not always going to have those supports. And the reality is the goal is for you not to have those supports all the time. We don't want people to be um, in speech language therapy for life. I, I tell people that all the time. It's not a life thing. It's really supposed to be a short duration thing. Mm -hmm. So in order for it to be a short duration thing, let's work on things that are functional for you that you can use in life. And then if you need to come back, if you need further assistance, then you can always do that. But let's get you to a point for things to be functional. Um, and I think for students, the biggest thing is like, when you're working with that person, get all the examples and all the resources that you can while you're working or have somebody there that can support you. Good. So in your, your role now, right? Um, you had to collaborate up with a lot of different professionals in different than different settings, right? Um, nurses, doctors, PTs, et cetera. How do you choose to engage and really build rapport, but also relationships with these people, some of whom may have, I put this in air quotes, right? A higher degree, a terminal degree, who may feel as if you know your industry, your profession isn't um, as qualified and or as valuable to the support and the health of uh, the client you're, you're hoping to serve. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is keeping it real. I don't beat around the bush. And I think if you can go into situations with um, respect of the other person and listening to their perspective, but also letting them know that you know your stuff. Um, I don't sit there when I'm talking with doctors and, you know, it, it's a respect thing. Um, but if I know what I'm talking about, I'm going to make sure that you know that I know what I'm saying and that I need you to hear me. Uh, I used to work in a hospital, so I interacted a lot with doctors and nurses. Um, and I will say that they were some of the best people to work with because they also pretty much kept it real. And so I think as professionals, um, especially in my field, we tend to have a lot of the flowery language or we wanna talk around situations instead of just addressing them head on. Uh, but that tends to be the best. Let's just call it what it is. Let's just shoot it straight. And then we can all figure out um, how we inner work with that if we are just keeping it 100 instead of trying to dance around the issues. I can only, I can only imagine. I can only imagine what it's like being, especially, I mean, again, you're younger. I say younger on purpose because age is relative, um, but you're younger you know, in an industry and in a, in a world that, you know, I feel like millennials, millennials run the world. We know this. But like, look down on us, right? Like, we don't know, our, to your point, we don't know our shit, right? We don't know, we, you just got out of grad school. You don't know this. Like, you, you know what you're doing in this one aspect, right? You may make these TikTok videos, et cetera, but you, what's it look like in real? We can do this shit. And obviously, you're showing you can do this shit. And I like how you said earlier that SLPs are, you know, communication experts. And you've taken that term, uh, not lightly, and created that the listening SLP platforms. Uh, so you talk to us more about the the inception of the listening SLP on social and how it's then evolved into you becoming a private practice owner. Yeah, so the listening SLP started, um, I went to ASHA, which is like the American Speech Hearing Association. We have a big convention in November. And that year was 2019. It was in Orlando. And I was like, oh, I, I've seen a couple of people on uh, Instagram. I was like, you know, I think I can do this thing and help. I, my original goal was to help students, hmm. was to help uh, other Black students who were trying to figure out how to get into grad school and how to be successful. So I was like, yeah, let's just do this. Uh, I like created a logo on Canva, had no idea what I was doing. And I sent it to a couple of people. They're like, yeah, yeah, that looks good. Uh, so then I just was like, all right, I'll do this. And I, I stopped. I think I was a little persistent until January of 2020 and I wasn't seeing like any followers. I was like, you know what, my, my actual job got kind of a little bit more difficult. Uh, and so I stopped and I just kind of left it alone for a period uh, till I had a coworker that was moved across the hall uh, from my therapy room. And she's like, you know, I have this Instagram. And I was like, yeah, I got one of those too. We followed each other and we encouraged each other to put out content. Um, she was probably one of the first people I collaborated with on Instagram. And then slowly but surely over these past two years, it has morphed into something I would have never imagined. Um, I still get to help students, which is nice. 
but it's really turned more into helping other professionals and helping families, um, specifically of children who are deaf and hard of hearing that use listening and spoken language, but also for people that have reading disorders and dyslexia as well. And so is it what, two, three years in now? Yeah, going on three. And you got 12,000 followers? I do, I do. And so what point during this, whether it's follower accumulation, um, follower engagement, did you decide that the LLC was the next move? Uh, so I think follower accumulation was probably one. And people were asking me to do um, lots of different things. And it wasn't necessarily bad, you know, work with this brand here, um, you know, write a blog post there. And that was cool. But I think the first thing was uh, I needed some legal protection <laughs> and got an LLC uh, okay. so that like for myself, I was a little bit more protected. Um, and then I was like, you know, I think I can do digital marketing. I, I couldn't take this a little more serious. And I started seeing like getting paid here and there for things. I was like, oh yeah, I can totally mm -hmm. do that. Um, mm -hmm. So I formed my LLC and now it is uh, about to be my private practice. So I'm excited. So what is one of the things, as you think about your journey, you know, starting as an undergrad and realizing that this was the career that you were going to you know, then pursue to where you are now, you know, what is one thing you learned about yourself through this process, through this journey? Uh, that I am resilient and that if I'm determined to do something, it is going to happen. Um, I, I tell people all the time, I did not see any of this for myself you know, freshman and undergrad, I was just there to have a good time and to go to school to be a pharmacist. Never in a million years would I be thinking that I'm shifting um, to eventually hopefully work for myself full time. And so I think being resilient, you know, I'm transparent with my audience. My grades weren't always the best in undergrad. I didn't get into grad school first round. I was not the first round draft pick. It took me a little bit of time to get there, but I got there. Mm -hmm. um, I was waitlisted for a long time until I got in. And then, you know, I got my dream job. Um, and then I left that dream job back in September. But I've still been able to make it through. And I've been making my field and my profession, my degrees work for me. Um, so, you know, being determined to like, if this is what I want to do, this is what's going to work for me. And I think making sure that I make it work for me, that I keep my life how I want it to be and not letting a job or anybody else kind of dictate that to me. You said you're gonna make your degrees work for you. And that's something that future Dr. Chelsea just mentioned on a podcast a lot two weeks ago. How are you doing that? Um, so one is by opening my own private practice. Mm -hmm. uh, the coolest thing about being an SLP is I am an independent practitioner, meaning that I do not need anybody's approval really to do what I want to do. Um, I'm not taking insurance. I, you know, I am making this work for me so that I can practice in the way that I want to practice uh, without worrying about stipulations from an employer mm -hmm. or stipulations from insurance companies telling me what they consider important and what they don't. Mm -hmm. my, my say is what matters the most. Um, so making that work. And then also I, I am still doing some like micro Instagram influencing stuff on the side. Uh, I work as an independent contractor for another company doing some uh, teacher instruction with literacy. So I'm shaping things to what I want to do and using my credentials to make that whatever it's going to be. Love to hear it. Love to hear it. Last question before we move to segment three. Continuing education is a big thing in, in every industry, right? I think all of us say we're lifelong learners. Some choose to engage in that a little bit more than others, whatever. But how are you continuing to stay on top of current trends? How are you continuing to shape and, and mold your own professional philosophy? And what are some things you're doing right now to, to continue to grow, to continue to learn? Yeah, I think that that's a great question. Uh, so we get inundated in speech with so much stuff because <laughs> our field is so big. Um, we can't know it all. And I would never say that I know it all. So what I do is I get really good at the things that I 
know that I want to know. Uh, so they have websites out there. The Informed SLP is one in which they take all of the research that comes out in our field and they synthesize it down to like, what is the most clinically applicable stuff today? So I am a subscriber of that. So that helps me stay relevant that way. Um, I still go to conferences. I am subscribed to some of our journals in our field and I read research that way. Um, I listen to some podcast count as CEUs in our field, depending wow. on um, what they are. And so I listen to those, but I pour into the things that are applicable to me. It's a life lesson right there. That's a, that's, a, that's a great way to start 2022, Sydney. That's a great, that's a fantastic <laughs> way. Seriously, with segment three, point of things that bring light to me. Segment three, how can I best support you? Right. You talked a lot about not just your industry, but also um, the lack of representation, hopefully the growing leadership of black professionals in the SLP industry. Uh, but how can I, how can I walk with TAB community best support you in your, in your, your future? Yeah. So I think like just having me on here is one. Um, talking about like what an SLP is, is something that brings me light, but I think it's something that not enough people know about. Uh, Figuring out how we can start incorporating, I loved how we talked about um, sports and higher ed. I think that there is a huge need for SLPs within that arena, especially um, with literacy. And so when I say literacy in this context, I'm not talking about like, can you read a word on a page? Hopefully by the time we're getting to college, we're able to do that, even though our national literacy rates would say otherwise. Um, but I'm talking about financial literacy. I'm talking about health literacy. Um, that is an area that I like personally find a lot of passion with in which I combine like my two degrees of public health and SLP a lot is with health literacy. Um, in financial literacy, we need athletes. We need these college students to really understand what they're signing up for. Unfortunately, in this country, we allow 18 year olds to take out thousands of dollars of loans without understanding one, how they're going to pay it back. Um, two, what the interest rates actually mean for them when that payment process starts back, what their projected income would need to be to even be able to make a minimum payment to pay this off within 20 to 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think pulling the experts in that can understand how we break down and synthesize information into more bite-sized ways for people to understand is um, gonna be helpful for any college student, but especially for our college athletes, especially as they you know, look to go pro and enter into that next phase of their life. Um, and then as far as me, listen, a follow and liking my content on Instagram or any social media at the listening SLP um, does wonders. As I am embarking on this private practice journey, if you know anybody you think could benefit from my services, send them my way. Uh, we are officially opening our doors. We're taking referrals. Um, so, you know, I'm just, I'm an open book. I, I'm happy to serve and help people. It's amazing. I'll be sure to put your uh, contact information uh, in, the, in the descriptions of this podcast, but also on Instagram. And for those listening, make sure you subscribe to the Listening SLP um, website. It's right there. It's right there. And it's free. Um, but Sydney, before we bounce, I have several questions for you, if you do not mind, if you don't mind. Go for it. Uh-oh. So your favorite sports memory? Ooh, that's a tough one. So it could be one uh... you get it in, play it at, watch on TV. What's your favorite sports memory? Okay, so I think I have two. So favorite one, um, I think in 26, 2015, we, uh, the marching band performed at a Panthers game. Hmm. So that was like really dope. And then as we were leaving the field, Cam Newton was standing right next to me. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, and then the second one was my first year of undergrad in 2013. We got to go to a New Year's Day Bowl. And I have never experienced anything like that since. What what I'll bet what what was it? Uh was it outback? Capital One? Capital One. Maybe 
I don't remember. I think it was Capital One. Hmm. Yeah, there's a blessing. The New York Six Bowls are blessings. Question two, your top five artists right now. You don't, you don't have to rank them in order, but just top five artists right now. Oh, man. Oh, that's tough. Um, I, like, haven't been listening to music like I used to. I'm, like, an old school girl. So I've been listening to, like, a lot of Jodeci, lots of old Mariah Carey, wow. Aaliyah. Um, what else have I been listening to? How many have I given you so far? Two. Two. Uh, well, Jodeci, Mariah Carey, at least Aaliyah. Yeah, I've been listening to Aaliyah. Um, I've been listening to a lot of her. I like her. She's pretty. She's pretty dope. Um, I don't even know. I don't know what I've been listening to. Been listening you want to know Drake? No Beyonce? No Taylor Swift? Uh, I mean, occasionally, but that's like very. It's a little too new age for me. I like trap. I mean, I listen to trap music, you know, as a genre. I don't have a favorite artist, but I I do. I listen to trap on a regular. That works. You make your own rules. Such a show podcast. You make your own rules. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Second to last question. If you could go to brunch, you plus five people, you plus five people, bottomless brunch, who are you bringing? The bottom of brunch. Uh, that's a tough one too. Okay, so I'm gonna pick people from different like aspects of my life that are influential. Mm-hmm. So I'd living probably pick my. What'd you say? Yeah, they'd be living, deceased, any point in history. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so one is gonna be my mom because that's like my heart right there, my go-to. Um, second would probably be um, Yanessa Humbert, who I mentioned earlier because. Homegirl is, she's fire. She is what I aspire to be in SLP world. Uh, third would probably be, well, you know, I'd love to have brunch with Michelle Obama. I, I find her to be quite fascinating as a person. Um, fourth one would have to probably be, you know, I'd love to have brunch with uh, Dr. Pastides. That man is pretty um incredible for y'all that don't know he's the um interim president of the university of south carolina right now um don staley would be another person i'd love to have brunch with too she's incredible in what she does um and then i'd probably bring like my best friend with me i like i'm a family person i like to have my friend group and my family close yeah shout your best friend on the pod yo Oh goodness. Okay, which one? No, I'm just oh, kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, never mind. Don't don't shout him out. Don't shout him out. Don't shout him out. Don't shout him out. That's like no, nah, that's a blanket statement. Uh, you no, 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 no. Gloria, Gloria knows she is like hands down my best friend. Um, we've been very, very close for a long time. So I definitely would bring her along with me. Yo, shout out to G. Shout out to G. Well, last question for you, Sydney. Uh, who do you want to see on this podcast? Who do you want to see and or hear from on this podcast? Oh, um, that's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I feel like you just pull along like great people. Anyway, I don't have anybody like exceptional I think of. Um, I think that it would be really cool if you could get Asia Wilson on this podcast. Mm. I know that's probably a dream, but that would be that would be dope. My USC heart would be happy. Plus I think she has a lot of, um, insight also like her dad was a big part of when they did the dyslexia bill in South Carolina. Oh, really? And he was, yeah, he, um, he was there when Henry McMaster signed it into law and that was a couple of years ago. So, I mean, she is, like phenomenal on multiple fronts, but I'd, I'd love to hear from her and kind of hear her more about her experience. I'm on it. I'm on it. We're on it. Let me get Asia. I'm coming for you. Tiffany Mitchell, you too. Tiffany Mitchell, I'm coming as well. Well, Sydney, before we bounce, anything else you want to share with the people? No, but just thanks for having me on here. You're too modest, yo. I asked you about your work philosophy. You said, listen, learn, and advocate. Yeah. Listen, learn, and advocate. And again, I think that's a, a lesson, not just that, you know, that you're applying in your work now, uh, but one that all of us listening to this pod right now can can take with us. 
I mean, every aspect of our life to make this world not just a better place and a more, a more socially just place, but a place where we can continue to keep walking in our purpose. So thank you for being on our podcast. Thanks, Tim. Of course, for everyone else, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Walk with TFB. Look forward to having more filter conversation with authentic people centered on education, sport, and culture. But as always, until then, walk with me.